Hi, we're here with uh, Dale Brown of uh, Detroit Threat Management uh, Services. And um, can you tell us about your background to start with? Uh, yes, uh, my background is that I was an airborne paratrooper. I was in the Army, and uh, after the military, I was a private investigator. Uh, I've been studying martial arts since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I had a chance to do as a private investigator was understand how law applied to self-defense. Is that, okay. is that too loud? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. That, and what, uh, what... Is that too loud over there? Are we... Okay. 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 Uh, yeah, uh, what uh, martial arts did you study uh, specifically? I uh, studied many different martial arts. The first one was Taekwondo, uh, and then Mudokwan, Chung Dukwan, both two different styles of, of, uh, of Korean martial arts, Taekwondo, and uh, later Hapkido, Akido, Jiu Jitsu, uh, Tai Jitsu, um, Chin Na, and I infused these uh, with Jiu Jitsu and Judo principles. I infused all of them together. Uh, into a new system, a training system I created called Eclecticon. Eclecticon stands for, it's a blend of two words, eclectic meaning a blend of styles, and K-A-N is a Japanese suffix which means system. So I created a blended style system, Eclecticon. Ah, okay, okay. And how did you get uh, involved in your current business? The what? business that I, that I have is uh, really a combination. First and foremost, we're a school. So it's called Detroit Threat Management Center. It's the name of our facility. What we're teaching and what we're, what we're using to defend people and corporations and communities is uh, preventive threat management. That's what we call what we're providing. We don't provide policing. We don't provide security. Although people refer to us often as private police or private security police or even security. Uh, when in reality what we're doing is providing a paradigm shift in safe public safety and corporate safety. So it's a completely new system. And it incorporates the understanding of psychology, law, and skill in that order. So we teach a lot about psychology, law, and skill that, as it relates to creating non-adversarial interactions for nonviolent outcomes. And the idea is that through this training, we're able to prove, because we're doing this in real life for the past 25 years, that you can create a safe environment, which is a prosperous environment, by protecting the people, whether they're rich or poor, and the wealthier people are gonna get rich as a result of the fact that poor people have a safe place to live. The businesses will have more patrons because there are more people alive to patronize yes. uh, the businesses. Uh, and so in essence, everyone wins. Even the local law enforcement in the community where a threat management center is located, a training center uh, teaches people how to protect themselves, teaches police officers how to protect and how to subjugate people without injury and death. So essentially, it is the bridge. A facility becomes a bridge between the public, the police, and prosperity for both, and creating a safer society by removing uh, violence and the way we see violence, because violence we view as the enemy of both corporate and public communities. Okay, and that seems to be a very a, a different approach from what what uh, established systems currently use. Um, and hey, you, do you have? Um, can you give some examples? Of, uh, some uh, examples of how that has uh, worked out. So when I first started, uh, the way that uh, I started was going to a wealthy business owner that opened that owned a lot of buildings, a lot of apartment buildings in Detroit, on the east side of Detroit. Uh, these apartment buildings house approximately uh, 2,000 people. Okay. These home invasions were costing the building owner uh, approximately $70,000 a month in revenue. So his buildings could not go over 30% occupancy because of the murders, because of the home invasions. I asked him for permission to hire me as his security, and then I would provide this, uh, my, my new method of training uh, and facilitation to volunteers from the streets of Detroit to protect his buildings in exchange for a free apartment in each building and a free office for me, which is not free, it's an exchange of service. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, we're doing an in-kind service. We're making a deal that they'll supply me with $2,000 a month cash, uh, one apartment in each building for the volunteers to protect their building, and a, and a training center one of, the, one of the office spaces, a 500 square foot office space, became my training center. Uh, and now, for example, our training center is approximately uh, 12,000 square feet. So uh, we've grown in the past 25 years. Um, and so what we, uh, what we found is that by making the family safe, 
by stopping the home invasion, stopping the murders, the rich man that owned the buildings went from 30% occupancy to 70% occupancy, eventually to 90% occupancy, and with no court dates, no injuries, no deaths. We use psychology to get the criminal element to leave. We made them believe this is only for families. As a result, it became conducive for families. As a result, the owner of the building made more money, the stores in the area made more money, so everyone was winning. And law enforcement got credit for having no crime in their area. So the law enforcement administrators were very supportive as a result of the fact that they, in fact, had lower crime stats because we got rid of the criminal elements in their area. So the plus, these are more serious crimes. These are home invasions and murders. So that gets wiped off the slot, and the, the police department gets known for having those occurrences not occur in their precincts. And as a result, they became very supportive. Uh, so in essence, we made rich people richer by making poor people safer and working class people. And as a result, everyone's a winner. And that's what we found in 1995. Oh, wow. And it's been continuing since then. So now we work for extremely wealthy people in their homes and businesses. We protect cigarette companies that were getting hijacked. Cigarette company started in 1998. It was a $250 million company. They're now a $350 million company. They lost all their insurances because they got robbed so often. They were losing 100,000 a month on average in shrink as a result of hijacking. So internal, external threat to their ability to maintain their business was at risk because of hijackings. This company started in, in the, in the uh, 40s. So they've been getting hijacked for many years. Uh, it's a controlled substance. Federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, state law enforcement all try to stop these hijackings. These hijackings were not stopped. We stopped them starting in 1998. That's how that company continued to do business in Detroit and how they're able to still distribute their products. Uh, and we've had not one violent episode since 1998. And we're still bodyguarding the trucks right now. So it shows that when you protect a product, when you protect people, when you keep them safe, you create the fertile ground required for prosperity. So it is through protection we can create prosperous environments for communities and for corporations. Okay. Okay, and, and during your, your talk, uh, you gave a, an example, if you, would you be willing to share that again, of a, um, uh, encountering an individual running uh, you know, in a hoodie and in the yeah. middle of the night. Yes. Uh, that, was, so, that was an impressive example. Yeah, really so what that. we specialize in is not uh, creating an adversarial environment, adversarial conditions, and violence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things I had to do is develop a way of uh, communicating with people uh, and with verifying and, and validating people and checking people in a legal way so that you're not violating people's rights while you're creating safety for communities and corporations. So in the middle of the night, for example, uh, we would have people come through in the middle of the night, walking around, drifting around, and what they were doing essentially was hunting families to see who was left their doors open or left the garage open or left their car open or see if there's a way to sneak into a house probably and home invade a home. We didn't let that happen because we would interact with them while they're on public streets. So we would not let them hunt the families. We would go talk to them ahead of time. We would film them. And when we interact with them, we would keep it positive. So for example, uh, one of the examples I give is early on, and we used to have guys hunting in the middle of the night just drifting through the neighborhoods uh, with hoodies on. We would pull up. Uh, in one case, um, I personally pulled up in my Hummer. I start filming. Young man has his head down and um, he's trying to hide his, his uh, face from the camera. And I said, young man, I said, have you seen any criminals out here tonight? And he looked up and he go, looked a little bit, just this, this a little bit so I could see just his eye. He goes, no, I haven't seen any criminals. Well, what do you ask? I'm not doing anything wrong. I said, young man, there's criminals out here and you need to be careful. You're dressed in all black. They might hit you with a car. They might, they might try to rob you. So what's going to happen is we're going to make sure you're safe by being right behind you. Okay? So if you have a problem, just raise your hand. We'll come rescue you. Okay? And meanwhile, he's trying to obscure, obscure his face because he's out hunting families. Mm. Uh, his hands are in his pockets. He could have a gun. I don't know. Uh, so then I say to him, you know, young man, there's one more option we have for you. You know, he had a story. He said, you know, I'm out jogging. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything illegal. Um, you know, I don't know why he even said, I don't know why you're filming me. We're filming you because we're required to film you by law to show we're being respectful to you, to show we're being polite and respectful and treating you, treating you with respect. The police make us do this, which is clearly not true. The police can care less. Uh, but we lie to criminals or people that would be criminals all the time because our objective is to create peace, right? Right. So to create peace in this case, what I'm gonna do is make him believe that we're connected to a larger entity. And that larger entity also uh, 
you know, is part of the situation, even though they're not. <laughs> so I say to them, you know, young man, we have another option for you. Because again, we're on public streets. We can't just go, give me your ID, show me your ID. Uh, so, and we don't want to, technically, we really don't care about their ID, but we want them to know that this is a very seriously protected area. So to convey that, we take it another level and we say, listen, young man, if you'd like to be in a good person file, we have this option for you. You totally, you know, by your consent, you could give us your identification and we could take a picture, put it into our good person file. Then if the police think you did something wrong, we could prove to them that you didn't because you're in the good person file. Would you like to be in the good person file? And he thinks about it for a minute and he goes, wait, uh, what would a good person do right now? Oh, yes, here, yes, take my ID. And the ID he gave me wasn't even him. <laughs> it's probably some ID he stole from someone. So I played it off, I took the picture, and I said, okay, young man, have a good night. Remember, we're right behind you. If there's anything wrong, raise your hand, we'll come rescue you. And he, just, <laughs> and he walks away, never comes back again. Wow. Never once came back for free bodyguard services. And so that's a way to ward off this criminal element. I don't know if he had a gun in his pocket. He probably did, I don't know. I don't want to know. What I want to do is create a non-adversarial interaction for a non-violent outcome. So not only did I get, discourage this criminal from hunting families, not only did I stop him from doing that, but I did it without creating any violence. In fact, no one in the community knew what happened. That meant they could sleep. That meant they felt good. That means their property value is not negatively affected by violence that occurred inside of their homeowner association area. So from non-violence, we create a protected environment and therefore a prosperous environment. Okay, yeah, and during your presentation, uh, you did a, a very good job of, of, of showing how uh, using a gun in self-defense in a situation like that is uh, not going to be that effective. Yes, um, yes. In close quarters, you know, it's important to remember that every dead police officer had at least two guns at mm -hmm. the time of their death. And the difference between a civilian and a police officer, not just the police officer typically has more training mm -hmm. uh, than, the average police, than the average civilian, but also... The difference is police officers got a chance to pick their point of contact with this person who ended up killing the officer. Where a person in the public is gonna be just the opposite. You're gonna be minding your own business when a criminal picks you. So you're in a much worse position than a police officer is. And a police officer was not able, in the cases where officers are, are murdered, officers were not able to use their gun in an effective way to save their life. So what I say to people is there's no way you're gonna, you should be able to consistently believe in any way that your skills are gonna be better than the dead police officers. So the gun was not the key to saving the officer, so there's no way it can be the key to saving us as people of the public that would be going up against predators either. Mm -hmm. So the key to protection and safety is not a gun, it is the procedures that deny the opportunity for predation and violence to occur. Okay. Which is mostly psychological and procedural, right? right? Not physical, once it gets physical, you've already failed. You fail to read the situation, you fail to de-escalate the person. You fail to create conditions for you to have a, a violence-free, threat-free environment, mm -hmm. right? So once that happens, like, it would be like letting a criminal onto a terrorist onto an airplane and then saying, you can't bring a bomb on here, right? right? We stop right. the terrorists way before they even get there. We even make them believe so much, they don't even show up at the airport. Mm -hmm. We don't even have terrorists get stopped at the airport now. They don't believe it's safe enough for them to even come to the airport. They believe there's so many safeguards. Whether it is or not, they believe right. that there are so many safeguards, they're not even getting caught at the uh, search point in the airport, right? And that's part of the psychology. That's part of the psychology. In other words, you've, you've affected them. So we need to do the same thing for violent criminals. They need to believe that your house, your home, your community, your corporation is not an acceptable target. Once they believe that, they won't try. Okay, and yeah, it, it's easy to see how a, going back to the example of the police officers, it's easy to see how they can um, end up in a shooting when the, um, uh, the suspected, the suspect uh, didn't really have a gun. Because at that point, they would be anticipating that he does. Exactly. And there's, it's, it's, it's a fraction of a second that they have to decide. Yes, and then also creating conditions for a decision mm -hmm. rather than removing the decision making. So if you want to remove decision making, what you do is either don't discuss it or close the gap in such a way that there's no way to pull the gun out in the first place. So it wouldn't matter if they decided to pull the gun and there was a gun, they couldn't pull it out because you closed the gap and you physically were in a position to biomechanically dominate that human threat condition, whether it was a gun or a knife. 
So what we do is train police officers and uh, members of the public to be so close to a person they can't pull the gun or knife in the first place. Then we show you what to do if they tried. Okay. So you're not exchanging bullets with someone. You're not trying to see how many times you can be stabbed or shot and still survive. Mm -hmm. If you are in position, you can literally disarm them and take away their weapon before they have a chance to harm you or continue harming you. Okay. So you can, you can reduce the number of bullets you, you, that you get shot by and reduce the number of times you're stabbed if you're in position to do so. Okay, yeah, one of the reasons I want, wanted to do this uh, uh, interview with you is because uh, here at the Anarchapoco, uh, anarchist and voluntarist, I, I have a, a philosophy that the um, that uh, nonviolence is the way to go. That you can solve things through peaceful, uh, peaceful, re uh, peaceful resolution. And um, I, outsiders or people who haven't been um, uh, introduced to that before will, say, will will often say, "Well, that's pie in the sky. That's utopia." But you actually have done it in the real world, right? And uh, do it. Right now, today, I yeah, have team you, members in Detroit yes. protecting communities, answering calls of people for assistance because someone's on their porch or at their house or in their backyard, attempting to break in their home, broken their home, uh, and we're answering these calls 24-7, okay. non-violently. Okay. And you have, uh, you mentioned you have a franchise uh, starting up. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so right now, our first franchise model is in effect in uh, uh, 2020. In the, uh, in the suburban area of Detroit. And we're opening schools, these, these uh, franchise schools, we're opening opportunity for people to open them in their communities. The idea is to have as many people trained uh, in the world as possible in creating nonviolence. So you're actually gonna be trained on how to manage threats for you, your community, your corporation, and how to do so nonviolently by understanding psychology, law, and skill, mm -hmm. so that you're ahead of violence and so you can defeat the violence without violence. So even when you have to disarm a gun and take someone's gun from them who's trying to kill you or your family, you, that's not violence. That's you taking their weapon and dominating that threat. And nine times out of 10, you're not gonna even injure the person. But if you do injure them, you're still gonna have multiple ways to save their life, even from their own stupidity. And what you'll find is a much better thing to focus on how not to kill people than it is to find reasons for righteous violence. Okay. Okay, and for, uh, for that training, how does one go about getting that training? Uh, so you can come to our facility. We have people that are flying in from other city, states, and countries okay. into Detroit. They stay with us for the weekend. They come in from Friday to Sunday. Uh, typically it's $1,000, and what they do is they go through training. They actually go through tactics, skills. They actually go on the field with the team members and see how we interact. They answer calls. They actually do a ride-along, in real a real tactical ride-along. And see, so they can see how you actually do this. And what we're going to be doing in the future is sending an instructor to a franchise location uh, where they will set it up and uh, train the on-site instructors there, the instructor, the owner, and uh, get it ready to go. And there'll be a video that's playing on their wall anyway, mm -hmm. so they'll be able to maintain continuity in the training to make sure it's consistent uh, and accurate training. And okay. the training is very simple, very practical, but it, it deals with all the things you'll need to protect yourself, your family, your community, or your corporation. So it's got 100 tactics, and that's everything from uh, you know hand-to-hand -hand situations where you physically, uh, again, our objective is to teach you how to escape, control, or immobilize threat, not to fight. So you're either gonna escape from them, you'll take control of them, or you will immobilize them. And immobilizing threat means you're taking from them the ability to stand, breathe, or see, or some combination of all three, within three moves or less. So there's no jumping around, it's not a sport, uh, so it doesn't matter if they're out of your weight class. What we're gonna show you is how to literally dominate that other human under violence conditions if it got violent, uh, and then how to do so without injuring and killing this person and by understanding biomechanics. So it's not that you're tougher than them, it's not that you're a better fighter than them, it's just you have a higher level of understanding of how the human body works, and that's how we're able to dominate threats. We're in Detroit actually using it. So again, this is not theory, this is 25 years out, none of us are dead, six of us have been shot, uh, the six of us that got shot are all alive, one female, five men, and we have always uh, managed to maintain control of the situation, meaning at the end, we never lost control of our facility. We're protecting the people we're protecting. More importantly than the fact that we're all alive is one thing. Every person that ever came to us for assistance, every person is still alive. Okay. No victim has ever been injured or killed after coming to us for assistance. And nine out of 10 of our victims that come to us for assistance are from domestic violence shelters, 
police officers refer them, police departments, um, shelters, prosecutors' offices. They refer people to us if they think they're going to be killed. Okay. And we've kept every one of them alive. And you mentioned that one of your, uh, in your in your presentation earlier, you mentioned one of your um, people was shot multiple times during during an event. Yes. And they survived. Yes, multiple people were shot multiple times. The only person who was shot once was a female. Mm -hmm. She was shot by a 7.62 caliber rifle in a drive-by, uh, through and through in the hip, standing right next to me. I pushed her head down. Uh, eight rounds went over her head, one went through her, uh, through her hip. This was a hit, uh, specifically against her. It was domestic violence related. And... Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that person was in traffic, six lanes of traffic. So there's no field of fire that was clear. There was no way to shoot back anyway. So mm -hmm. the fact that we don't carry weapons is because of firearms. Uh, we carry different types of non-lethal weapons, but we don't carry firearms anymore because we don't need them. Uh, and that's a prime example. It, there's no way to have shot back into this car without shooting other people in the community. Uh, it's literally impossible. We work in, in environments with lots of people. Yes. So it's just, unless you're living in a very rural area where bears are around, perhaps you could shoot into the area uh, with uh, little, a little, you know, fear of hitting another person. Okay. But uh, typically, if you're in any kind of a environment where there's multiple family members on the side of a structure, mm -hmm. or neighbors that are close, or if you're in an urban environment, shooting a weapon uh, is a double-edged sword because it can overpenetrate the person. It can overpenetrate buildings. It can ricochet and does. And the difference between a civilian and uh, or a member of the public and a police officer is police officers qualify for immunity. So when their bullets overpenetrate or ricochet, they're not charged. You and I, if we shoot someone by accident or overpenetration or ricochet, we will be charged. Okay. So that's another reason why being gun dependent is not in your best interest uh, because your field of fire may not be clear and you will be charged for shooting the other people. Okay. So, so if you got the bad guy, if your bullet went through them or around them, or some of them just happened to go past them and shoot some other people, you will be going to prison for shooting the other people. Okay, so you may actually be safer without the gun. Yeah, absolutely, and then there's non lethal mm -hmm. options. So there's different types of, of munitions. Uh, there's different types of um, uh, marker weapons like paintball guns that mm -hmm. look like real guns. Absolutely, there's no difference, except they shoot a rubber round and a pepper round. And that's what we use. And so, the, yeah, non-lethal. They're weapons. totally non-lethal. Yeah. So okay. they could, you know, they could uh, cause welts and you know um, bruising, but they could not kill a person. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I guess that concludes our interview. I, I appreciate you coming Thank you. here to, to do this. Yeah. Well, I let everyone know they can contact us at threatmanagementcenter.com. Right. You can look at YouTube and look at our videos. We have over 600 videos on YouTube. Detroit Threat Management Center. Uh, and look up, uh, definitely when you go to our website, threatmanagementcenter.com, okay. please look at our video testimonials of police officers, police testimonials, and most importantly, victory testimonials or victim testimonials. We don't have victims, we have victories. And if you look at the testimonials, you'll see where all these different women and children and elderly and males and females we've protected for the, over the years and kept them all alive. So the point is that freedom requires training. We must train to create the freedom we want. We can't ask for it. We must maintain it, and it's our choice, right? We can create uh, the freedom we want for ourselves, for our neighbors, and we, the way we create that is by having the education to not allow someone to take our freedom from us. And that's what this training is about. Okay. Maintaining your own personal freedom, making sure that you have the ability to protect yourself and your family safely from civil and criminal liability as well, mm -hmm. and making sure that uh, no one does anything to you or your family you do not want them to do. You are in charge, you are not helpless. You have all the solutions and that's what we're here to do is help families have the solutions they need to maintain their freedom and their safety. Okay, well thank you. Thank you, sir.